Well, good morning. I can't uh, begin to say how incredibly happy I am to be here and how excited I am that Alex and Felipe invited me. There's no way that I can follow the uh, initial act, but I'm going to try to at least explain to you about the power of the brain. And it's going to be about food and memory. And as you can see, there's nothing here in my title that says that I have anything to do with food. As a matter of fact, I'm a neurosurgeon. I think if I came here and I wanted to tell Alex about how to spice a dish, he would probably put me in some kind of martial arts hold and uh, ensanguinate me. But nevertheless, I do know a lot about the brain. And neurosurgery is something that has been done for as long as we've had human societies, for as long as we've had cultures and we've domesticated animals and we've had uh, foodstuffs that are domesticated, we've had neurosurgery. Some of the things that I do, for instance, uh, I can take really small problems and make it seem like they never existed, and then I can take really big problems like this and actually do something that's so incredible in the brain. We can keep patients awake, have them talking, map out different parts of their brain, and then take these uh, problems out. So I, I think I'm here for one reason, to tell you a little bit about the brain and a little about memory and how that all happens and how that relates to fine dining and gastronomy. One of the most incredible things that I think I have the opportunity to do is this. Uh, we've got some video, if you guys don't mind playing it. So one thing that I can do is I can put these electrodes into somebody's brain. And this patient over here in the middle, he has this tremendous tremor, this shake. You can imagine, he can't even eat. He can't feed himself. So we're talking about food. We're at a food conference. We're having a dialogue about food. But he can't get food to his face. It goes all over the place. But if we use the currency of the brain, which is electricity, put these electrodes in and put them in the right spot, you can see it's almost like magic. So I'm not trying to tell you that I have the sort of answers to everything, because I clearly don't. But I am telling you that I think I'm a valid person to be here to talk to you about uh, how the brain works. Along the way, I've had the really wonderful opportunity to meet some people, uh, uh, chefs, restaurateurs, both in their restaurants and outside their restaurants. And uh, really, last May, I had this incredible opportunity to come to Dom to meet Alex. And I think the reason why I'm here and talking is because of a brief conversation that Alex and I had. And that was to tell him, in a way, well, first to thank him for allowing us to be there, but to tell him in a way that people don't really come to a restaurant like Dom because they're hungry. I mean, obviously you're coming for dinner or you're coming for lunch and you do want to have food, but food is readily available for many of us. It's not 10,000 years ago where food was scarce and every day was food insecurity. When you come to Dom or when you come for fine dining and gastronomy, what you're looking for are memories. You're looking for curation of new events in your life. And just like I can look at my shoes, I can buy them. Two years ago, I bought them. I can still look at them. They're a physical representation of what I have. But when you go to a restaurant, there's no physical representation that you walk out with. So unless there's been an actual memory, an actual emotional encoding of that experience, it's anonymous. And I think what the chefs do around the world is this amazing opportunity to actually curate your memories and curate the stories of your lives. And that's, I think, what we're here to talk about. So this is, I think, what was read earlier. And I'm not trying to be facetious, but Food is obviously critical for survival. That's no uh, surprise. But because it's so critical, that means that it's a very powerful driving force for evolution. And I would uh, tell you over the course of this talk that memory, memory about where food is, healthy, nutritive food, was one of the main driving forces. So food drove our evolution of memory. And during uh, Fruto, I'll try to talk to you a little bit, you know, human evolution is 500 million years, and we're not going to be able to get through that in 20 minutes, but I'll try to give you a brief sense, a brief glimpse of that, and so this wonderful magic that happens every time that you have a fine dining gastronomy experience, or, or any food experience that's memorable. This is a little bit of um, uh, uh, a bold statement to make, uh, but I think it's really true. I mean, 
Food is a pharmaceutical compound. In the United States, people take Prozac. It makes them happy or makes them happier. But there's no reason why food doesn't do the same. When you have chocolate, when you have a good Bordeaux, when you have these things, they affect you. They affect your brain. And that's where their power lies. So what happens when you're in a restaurant, when you're at a street stand, where you're anywhere, you're actually affecting your brain. And that's what I'd like you to keep in mind. We talked about the brain, and we're going to play this. But you don't even need to have a brain to know that you're hungry. Food is that important. And that's what this picture shows, or this um, video. This is a single grain of sugar. And these are bacteria. Bacteria don't have brains. They don't know they're hungry. But nevertheless, having that food source there drives them to it. So food is that powerful. So I think if we're going to talk about food and we're going to talk about memory, we really have to invoke this fellow here. This is Marcel Proust. He's an essayist, a novelist, uh, probably one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. And he talked about involuntary memories. These are the memories of nostalgia. And in this incredible novel, uh, A la recherche du temps perdu, uh, or in other words, uh, In Search of Lost Time, many of you will know this, but for those of you that don't, he talks about taking a madeleine, dipping it in some tea, and bringing it to his mouth, and immediately he's transformed to his childhood, to his Sundays, to when he was nine. So food is like this magic time machine, because it brings us back in time. And that's exactly what's happening when we have a dining experience. So if we're going to talk about food and we're going to talk about these things, I'm not going to make you brain surgeons or neurologists because that would bore you, but I do want to get you to talk or understand about where are the places in the brain where these critical things are happening. And they have these funny names. One is called the amygdala and the other is the hippocampus. It's in your temporal lobe, which is just behind your eye, but just in front of your ear. So this is a critical place. Right here is where all your memories are formed. If you don't have that space, if you have a tumor, if you have a trauma, you will probably not effectively make memories. And if you don't make memories, then you have no stories. And if you have no stories, you can almost ask, ask yourself, are you really aware, awake, and alive? Because we are storytelling animals. This is a little bit of the uh, sort of the teacher or lecturer in me, and I want to point out that I'm making a really fine distinction because I think it's really, really critical. So memory is the ability, not surprisingly, to remember past experiences. But learning is that process that modifies your behavior. So for instance, when you go to Dom, you have an amazing time. Your memory of that is what affects your behavior. That's how you learn, and that's why you want to go back. So these are some small little uh, notions that I want to kind of bring across. And memory really isn't perfect. I think we all realize that. Memory is like this picture here. You take a picture, you tear it up, you throw it into all the different drawers of the brain, and then you try to reassemble it. So if you're ever at dinner and you're two, three, four people, not everyone's going to have the exact same memory of that meal. And that's not necessarily bad, or that's not necessarily wrong. There are imperfections to our memory, and they're for very good reasons. This is that part of the brain, and I operate on that part of the brain. People who have epilepsy, that have seizures, have terrible memories, or many of them do. And it's amazing to think that you could take out, you see, here's the eye, here's the ear, you could take out this part of the brain, you could actually remove a part of the brain, and your memory actually improves. And that's, that's what I do. If, they, if you have a seizure, I go, I find this place. It's called the amygdala and the hippocampus. I take it out, and then we can uh, cure people's seizures and improve their memory and improve their livelihoods. So I'm going to give you a little uh, introduction about a little bit of neuroanatomy, a little bit about evolutionary biology, and a little bit about how our memories formed to help protect us. And so here's a story, uh, whenever I tell it to a scientific audience, they really don't understand this, but I think most people in gastronomy know that there are two different types of almonds. Almond is amygdalus from Greek, 
Uh, and amygdala, not surprisingly, that's the part of the brain that I take out because it looks like an almond. So there are two varieties. One is called prunus dulcis dulcis, or sweet almond, and the other is called prunus dulcis amata, which is a bitter almond. And I think anyone that does pastry here will know, and certainly many of the chefs will know, that there's a problem with bitter almonds. And the problem is they're poisonous, and they have cyanide. As a matter of fact, in the United States, the FDA, our Fed Food and Drug Administration, forbids having bitter almonds imported to the United States. So bitter almonds will kill you. And why will they kill you? Because they have this structure. There's the amygdala, there's amygdalin, and that's this compound. This compound is a slightly complex compound, but it's really composed of sugar, table sugar, the essential oil, which is that wonderful flavor that we love from almonds, and then there it is, cyanide. So if you're this proto-human 10,000 years ago, and you cannot make the distinction between bitter almonds and sweet almonds, you're going to have a bad day. So again, think about it. 10,000 years ago, we were nomadic. We didn't have to remember where we lived. 10,000 years ago, we probably didn't even have mates that we had to remember who we were going home to. But what you did have to remember was what were nutritive foodstuffs and what were dangerous or poisonous foodstuffs. And that's really what's driven our memory. Okay? So that's what happens. In fine dining, we almost co-opt that evolutionary biology, and that's where we create memories of these wonderful events that affect our behavior that bring us back. We can't really talk about memory unless we really get some terms to it, but I just want to point out to you that memories are not like these straight lines that go from one point in a computer to another point. Memories are these really, really messy things, uh, and I think that's also part of their beauty. I'm just simply re-enforcing uh, the fact that memory is that ability to recall, whereas learning is how we affect our behavior. And advertisers try to do that with our memories. They try to affect our behavior. Um, this is not the time to spend uh, an hour about the psychology of memory, but there are about three different terms I'd like you to know. There's sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory, and that's what happens every time that you try to either remember your favorite singer from a rock band or your favorite food. And I'll go through those very quickly. Sensory memory is exactly that. We have senses. We have our vision, we have our hearing, we have our taste, we have temperature, we have touch. And sensory memory is absolutely precise. If something's sharp, if something hurts, that's because it's sharp and it hurts. It's absolutely precise. There's no ambiguity about it. There's no ambiguity about the flavor or the essence of an orange when somebody unpeels it. But sensory memory is absolutely brief. It only lasts for a few milliseconds. It's like you get that whiff of the orange, boom, and then it's gone. Okay. The next level of memory is what's called short-term memory. Not surprising. Short-term memory is not permanent. It's temporary unless we really make an active conscious effort to retain it. It's sort of like mathematics. There's no reason to remember 7 times 7 unless there's a reason to know it, like, say, for a test. Okay? So that's how our short-term memory works. And the other thing is that our short-term memory really only about holds about seven items. And that's, in fact, why in the United States, when they made phone numbers, they made them seven digits, because people really couldn't remember any more digits more than that. And that's something that I often, uh, will often tell people uh, in the service industry. If you come to a table and you present a bread, and you're so enthusiastic about that bread, and you tell them that there are all these grains in it from old grains like emmer and the amaranth and things like that, if they're not a grain farmer, once you started to tell them this laundry list of grains, they're going to forget it. So you'll cloud their memory. You'll actually give them no memory of it. So if you were just to come to them and say, please enjoy our wonderful bread, it would be more effective. Short-term memory and long-term memory work this way. You have your sensory input. You either remember it or continue thinking about it, or you discard it. Short-term memory is like a leaky bucket. We pour things into that leaky bucket, and it just all drips out. We have to make a conscious effort to retain it, like I said, seven times seven, or it doesn't mean anything. Long-term memory 
is the most tricky thing. Long-term memory is the problem that we have with many uh, neurological diseases, like Alzheimer's, for instance. But memories, and that's something that I really want to emphasize, especially when it comes to, say, something like fine dining. You know, while I look at my shoes and I can buy my shoes and they're a tangible representation of something I've done, my shoes are only going to last for maybe two years. Our memories, if you have a memory from when you're 10 and you think you're going to live till, I don't know, say about 85, you can have memories that are with you for 75 years. That's incredible. You have this thing that's somewhere in your brain that's so indelible because you've created a long-term memory out of it. And that's, I think, the magic of what the chefs around the world do. They create these long-term memories. And that's, that's, that's the most amazing thing for me. So long-term memory has two different parts. There's a conscious part and an unconscious part. And again, I'm not trying to get uh, too technical here, but the conscious part has something that's called autobiographic events. It's kind of our Instagram in the brain. So what happens is it's just like taking pictures. These are snapshots of places and times. We're all here at Fruto. We have this sort of incredible emotion about being here. These are our autobiographic memories. Then there's the semantic memory. The semantic memory is what uh, is not necessarily obvious. It's, there's no reason to know that Paris is the uh, capital of France, uh, no more than there is to know that 7 times 7 is 49. Semantic memory is what's called the textbook memory. So for instance, you know, if Alex is asking somebody on the line to make the heart of palm fettuccine, they don't have any concept of that unless they have the semantic memory of that, that textbook memory. There's yet another form of memory that's called unconscious memory. And that unconscious memory is really the memory that sort of advertisers work at. That form of memory is really the emotional memory. That form of memory is the memory that, for instance, in the United States, people have fast food. I'm sure they have it everywhere. But you could have like a thousand Big Macs. And Big Mac number one is no different from Big Mac number 359 or no different from Big Mac number 999 because there's no emotional content to that. But if you were stuck in the Atacama Desert and you came out and somebody gave you a Big Mac, I guarantee you, you would remember that Big Mac for the rest of your life. So the unconscious memory has to do with uh, emotional memory as well as what's called a procedural memory. And those are things that really formulate themselves. Procedural memory, really for the diner, doesn't do anything. Procedural memory is just that. It's what you do with the procedure. Procedural memory is very important in the back of the house, in the, in the kitchen, because procedural memory is just like tying your shoelaces. So if you're cutting an onion, you want that uh, guy on the line to be able to cut that onion very quickly and not have to think about it. That's your procedural memory. So that really doesn't affect the diner. But what does affect the diner is this thing, emotional memory. And that's really what Proust talked about. And that emotional memory is that nostalgic memory, that memory of the uh, Madeleine that gets dipped, that gets you that sense, transports you back in time. So that's the memory that Proust is talking about. But I think that even more importantly, the memory that I'd like you to think about, and I think the most genius thing about the chefs uh, uh, today is that they're not making emotional memories. They are making these nostalgic memories, but they're making emotional memories that are new de novo, novel memories. Remember if, uh, say, if Alex is making me a dish that maybe his grandmother made, well, my grandmother's from India. We have no context. So what really matters is that magic of making that new memory. And that new memory is, I think, like I said, evolutionarily driven for us because we find safe, wonderful foodstuffs. So, I think just in the uh, interest of time, I'll, I'll move on. I just want to absolutely thank Alex and his organization, Fruto and uh, Felipe, for having me be here. That's a little bit of uh, 500 million years of human evolution in a nutshell. Uh, the brain in the bottle means that uh, I'm done, and that's uh, usually when my day is over. I'm at the Bitter Almond, so if anyone wants to find me, you can find me. Let's continue this dialogue, this Fruto's dialogue, and I uh, thank you so much. Thank you.